My name is Emily Cushman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cura Talent, and we are currently at the Ryerson DMZ in Toronto, Ontario. Um, so the job interview process is extremely important, not only for the employer, but also for the applicant. Um, I think what we're seeing more and more is that for the employer, you know, even in the stages of interviewing, it's just as much about recruiting and branding and showing off the company, the culture, who's working there, um, as it is about, you know, finding the right applicant. And on the applicant side of things, you know, again, it's just about showing that personal brand, being able to show your skills on top of just, you know, the experience, the academic, um, and really, you know, why you are a cultural fit for that company. So when it comes to interviews, you know, there are a lot of pain points for employers. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that we hear very often is that they either get too few applicants or they get way too many applicants. And what ends up happening, especially in smaller companies, is that they don't actually have the resources to deal with all of the applicants that they're getting, you know, into their pipeline. Um, and it's very costly, you know, sometimes this involves travel costs. Um, and then, you know, if you're bringing the the wrong people in, you know, generally for, for interviews, both, both on the phone or in person, usually it's, you know, one hiring manager on one end and then the applicant on another. So it's not very collaborative. Uh, so you just get, you know, really one person making the decision as to who should be brought in for that next level of interview. And again, when there's, when there's a lot of people coming in through the funnel and very limited resources, that, that causes, you know, bad decision making sometimes. There are several costs associated with making a bad hire. Um, you know, the actual dollar amount is on average $37,000. Uh, for every bad hire that you bring in and that's really just factoring in the interview process that you went through to bring that person in so that's everything from you know a couple hundred dollars on the job posting uh, you know 20 30 plus hours that you spent doing the phone interview um, you know average phone interview is 20 30 minutes plus the time that you took to schedule that phone interview maybe a couple more time scheduling if you know you couldn't find the right date and and finally you know flying people in, traveling uh, to really bring people in for the in-person interview. Uh, again, those, those costs continue to accumulate, especially if you have several people in the room at the same time. Cure Talent is a video interview screening software that allows recruiting managers to send out video questions and applicants to reply back through video. Online video screening offers a lot of benefits uh, compared to traditional methods. 70% of communication is, is body language, it's the, the non-verbal factors, and that's exactly what video brings to the table. That ability to see, you know, in 60, 90 seconds, yes, this person is a fit, you know, they should be in for the for that next stage of interviewing. The asynchronous feel of the platform, basically how it works is on the recruiting side, you can record video questions once. So as opposed to, you know, doing a phone interview with 20 people you, where you're re repeating the same questions over and over. Uh, on Kira, you just record once, you send them out to your applicants either by email or you can actually embed them right within the online application so that, you know, it completely eliminates the scheduling piece. Applicants can, you know, take the interview, look at the interview on their own time. They see the question once and then as soon as they, they see the question then a little timer pops up so it's usually you know 30 to 40 seconds to think about it and then their webcam will automatically turn on and start recording their video response so then you know essentially once the applicant responds to the interview the hiring manager gets all of these videos uh, sometimes hand in hand with the online application so that as they're reading the essays, they're watching the videos, they're getting that glimpse. So again, removes all of the scheduling, the repeating of questions, um, removes time zones because now again, people can take this on their own time. Major pain points we've seen from employers is that, you know, they're at the office until eight, nine o'clock at night because a lot of people can only do phone interviews once their day job is done. So it again, eliminates that whole process fewer applicants, but better quality. So it was almost, you know, doing the video was another barrier to really see, you know, who is committed to this, to going to the next step in the, in the job interview process, um, which is really critical because sometimes you have, you know, hundreds, thousands of applicants who just spam resumes everywhere. Um, so creating that extra step. So I think the increasing use of cloud-based uh, HR tools, I think it says a lot about today's hiring practice. I think 
people have gotten so fed up with antiquated systems that have not changed in 40, over 40 years, and now we are just seeing a huge wave of innovation in, you know, human resource, human resource technologies, and it, it's going to completely, you know, sweep North America. We're already seeing, you know, a big start towards that. Biggest piece of advice I would give, uh, especially to, you know, smaller companies looking to recruit employees, is that. You know, as you mentioned before, there are so many new technologies that are out there to help facilitate this process. Everything from picking out the best questions to getting, you know, the best candidate. Now more than ever, it's readily available, like anything you could imagine uh, to help you out. So just, I, I would encourage them to go out and look for it and to go, you know, start utilizing technology as a core part of their recruiting process. Here you have an economic recession, a global meltdown, and you're faced with a regional meltdown with regards to the decline in manufacturing. So the city, the region, uh, the county municipalities have all had to pull together and really focus on our core areas of competencies. Recognizing that the automotive footprint, which was very strong and robust, I was going to come back, but it perhaps would not occupy the same footprint. So we've had to really focus our efforts on diversifying into other sectors. The challenges that this region has faced most recently are probably the most significant faced by any city uh, in Canada uh, and certainly in North America. Our challenges were uh, twofold. Uh, one, uh, the constant decline in manufacturing since 2002, which was uh, made uh, even worse uh, and compounded by the uh, global economic recession that followed. Uh, as a region, we've been trying to diversify, we've been trying to uh, reinvent ourselves, and uh, we're trying to do that amidst this global recession, which really put a lot of pressure uh, on the region, put a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the investors in this region, but certainly put a lot of pressure on the people in this region. Uh, this region is a very close region. Uh, people know each other, and uh, it's not uh, hard to say that uh, if you walk around and you speak to people, they've had family members, they've had neighbors, brothers or sisters, mothers or fathers uh, that have been affected by the global economic recession. So the challenge has been very real on a number of levels and uh, has uh, had a significant impact uh, on many in this region. This was an opportunity for us to turn this region around. This was an opportunity for us to use this crisis to reposition this region for post-recession. To make sure that we are investing in our academic institutions and make sure that we are skilled trade force uh, and workforce stayed here and remained here. And here we are several years later, uh, post-recession coming out of it. The recovery is still fragile, but the investments that we've made, uh, the investments that we uh, have made over the last several years uh, have helped us uh, reposition this region for opportunities that now present themselves. And one of the most difficult things to do in a crisis is to try to pull people together towards a common goal and establish a common vision. That's what the economic roadmap does. The economic roadmap pulls this region together, identifies the areas that are areas of strength for this region. It basically says these are things that we're good at, these are things that we can excel at, these are sectors that we've identified that are complementary towards our natural advantages and our natural strengths. It doesn't reinvent the wheel. So some people use the term collaboration, some people like to say, well, it's time to come together and work together. Well, I think the economic roadmap has brought us together. My belief is it's time to roll up our sleeves. Uh, the thing I love about this region is its resilience. Uh, the makeup of its people is unique, but more importantly, the compassion of its people. Uh, we ensure that we take care of our own, and we're always, always in it together. And that's, very, that's a unique quality for this region. Uh, we would have never been able to get through what we've gotten through over the last several years uh, had it not been for that quality. So what I love about Windsor-Essex is its resilience, its uh, can-do attitude, its spirit not to give up, and certainly the passion of its people that make us very unique and allow us to stand up very proud and very tall and, uh, in good times and in bad. True measure of value. Is it bank stock or is it real estate or is it sovereign debt? As we've seen over the last couple of years, all of these long-term measures of value have crumbled, have changed, have been totally altered. So how we measure value and what we value has undergone tremendous change in the last couple of years. Therefore, what companies, what individuals, and what causes truly value and the way they build value long-term has to be on the sight lines of every leader who's out there. So what is the world's most valuable asset. For 20 years, I've been thinking about that question. I've been wondering about it. It's been keeping me up at night. It's been something that has uh, become an obsession, actually, with me. So the idea behind this book 
is to answer the question, what is the world's most valuable asset? When you start, you have passion. And passion is like the spark. It's the flame. What you need is more than passion because passion is just an emotion. How you build passion capital is to take the seven building blocks or the seven principles that you add to that basic level of passion. With those building blocks, they're like the fuel. When you have the flame or the spark of your passion, you have the seven building blocks or principles of passion capital. When those ignite, the fire that burns, the energy that comes from that, the intensity and sustainability, that is the passion capital. Hi, I'm Lauren Brace and I'm from talentag.ca. I think that I've kind of always um, been a little bit of an entrepreneur. The easiest way to talk about how I started Talent Egg is to, uh, is to tell my own story. When I was a teenager, um, I decided that I wanted to be an actress. I thought, okay, well, you know what? That's a really bold idea, a bold goal. You know, very few people are successful in that line of work. So, Lauren, what are you going to do to get there? I went to a job board. It was on Queen Street at the time, at, at a place called Theater Ontario. It was literally, I'm not talking about like a job board like work got was. I'm talking about it was like a cork board with jobs posted on it. And I decided, okay, well, there's this internet new shiny thing um, out there, and um, and it's starting to get really, really popular. This is kind of mid '90s, late '90s, um, and I'm, I'm kind of really geeky, um, so I'm going to start my own website for young actors. So I bought the domain name bigdreamers.com and, and built and, and started my own online community for young actors, um, mostly in Canada. It's this idea around, around goal setting and ambition and um, doing what I have to do to get to that sort of final, final stage. I will always remember the very first time we got a really serious, no, we're not going to buy talent eggs. We're speaking with one of the biggest telecom companies in Canada and they're saying and they're all over it. they're like this is awesome best thing since sliced bread I want it I want it I want it send me the contract um, it's gonna take me two weeks to sign we call back two weeks from then and you know at this point we still haven't gotten any yeses and the woman on the phone the tone had just completely changed she was like you know what I actually think um, that you guys are a little bit arrogant you're product is unproven and to me that just seems like an unbelievably insane amount of money to ask for for something that has that isn't proven in the market at all and I cried um, I actually started crying not on the phone luckily um, I took it really really harsh what came out of that is that that was the first of, of many many no's and I just got better at it most people are gonna face a lot of no's and it's kind of how you deal with it that, uh, that maybe separates you my name is Lauren Frace and I am my ambition I'm Patrick Lohr and I'm a technology entrepreneur and Alberta has been an amazing environment for me to grow my business and I'm encouraging young people and experienced entrepreneurs to get together and use the technology and the resources that we have available to diversify the economy of this province. Um, you know we have an incredible amount of riches that we need to take advantage of and one of those riches is our imaginations and our educational system. So I encourage all entrepreneurs to just get together, create great businesses, and count on the support of the community. You're gonna have the support of mentors, you're gonna have the support of business people and the investment community. So get out there and do it. Obviously find your passion, but what that means is in today's world, uh, don't just chase the short-term money opportunity or the short-term uh, job opportunity. The job that you're taking next is not the destination. It's the career that you're building that is the destination. So if you find the stream that you want to swim in and get into it and stay in that that makes you passionate, it'll be great, but it's not a short-term thing. The career is built on network and the network we often think about from a one-way uh, point of view which is wrong it, the network is a two-way point of view which is the community and the Haskane school community and the community that you live in and the community that you serve through the organization you're with 
and the global community, and it's a two-way community. So serving that and building the relationships within it and doing good always will come back and work its way around, and that's how you create your career. So it's not always about money? It's not always about money. Uh, not about short-term money. You know, if you want to make your money over the long term, I think you'll have a lot of opportunity if you're serving in the right community and you're doing things that you like. Well, so the MBA gave a few things to me and I feel it was really helpful. First of all, it gave me some vertically specific skills, finance, accounting, statistics, and things of this nature, problem solving, all of those types of things. There's a half-life to those skills uh, unless I keep them up. The horizontal skills of how to deal with other people, how to get things done, how to align, how to create a network, those are very invaluable. And the, I've relied on a lot of those throughout my career to start building the team and community around what I want to do that will help me grow. The University of Calgary was my first choice. And it was not only because I was living in the city, but because at the time the new faculty was being built, the new building was being developed, there was an energy, there is an energy around it. Calgary is an, a, a city of high energy, it's a new thinking city. So I really r respected those ideals and they resonated with me and I wanted to be part of it. The balance is hard, uh, there's no secret about it. You have to recover hours in a day that you never thought were possible. But I, uh, what I found, which is what I believe, is that we have a lot of time in our lives that we spend not productive. And it forces you to be productive. And the only axiom that uh, if you want something done, ask a busy person. The more you load onto it, it's amazing how much you get done. So after the first month, I actually didn't find that it was uh, an overhead. It wasn't a burden. I just figured out how to make the time work. So I would just recommend go full steam into it, be committed, and it'll work itself through very quickly. Yeah, so vision in my life and my career blend together. And I have a vision for where I wanted to go and the types of things I wanted to do. My vision was to have impact at the broadest scale possible that was available to me. So today that's landed me on the internet, which is the biggest scale opportunity we have. And I've never wavered from that vision. And I've taken a lot of short-term job stops or twists and turns, although those weren't the destinations I was really interested in. Some didn't excite me, but I knew it was moving me closer to a place where I could have a global impact, which is where I am now. So have that vision, stay true to it, and don't be hooked by this short-term move and the, the need to make every career stop the ultimate destination. Because in a game of chess, you don't go for a one-move close, most cases. You play the game, and every now and then you have to move a pawn, but you have to do it with vision. So uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating question because we are bombarded with information. I, I don't know that there's new information in the world. It's just much easier to get to. Uh, over the last five years, the Internet has enabled that, both from a creation as well as an access. So what, the shift has happened from those with skills to find information to those with skills to take massive amounts of information and distill it. And I think we're still a little bit lagging in the educational institutions on how to distill that, how to take 17 things and make meaning out of one thing and then build the action plans to focus on it, get it, drive it. And I would encourage everybody to really spend time because I think the way you stand out isn't by presenting information that anybody can get access to anymore, it's by distilling it into real meaningful things. So thought is alive and well today and needed. Execution is the most important. I see, particularly in Silicon Valley, a lot of ideas that are dreams. And unless you can execute them by getting something clear and desirable to market, they stay dreams. And dreams are great for a certain part of our life, but they're not how you create value. And so execution is the plan to take that dream and break it down into bite-sized chunks that can be executed on. And simplifying it into stages where people can actually mobilize for action. And the leader that's able to do that is truly a leader. First of all, my base working assumption is a great attitude is the greatest asset. People love to be around people that exude energy, not unnecessary confidence, but energy. You're just energized, you're moving on things, you're, you're thinking, you're creating, you're a positive contributor. But, but negative attitude is really a bad thing, and ego is a horrible thing because there's a lot of really smart people in the world, and you need to be open to them. So uh, towards the attitude of the world, uh, or towards the world, I think with your eyes open and your ears open, 
and the desire to learn from people will always put you in the right frame of mind. But keeping positive and energized around that, I think, is great. It's taken me a long time to get to CEO role. And frankly, I never had an aspiration to have a CEO title. I had an aspiration back to my vision to have an impact. That could have been in many different forms. And it just happened to materialize in a CEO role. But there could have been many other ways that the opportunity presented itself. And I would have been just as passionate about those, even though it didn't have the title. So. I see too many people stuck on titles. Don't get stuck on titles. Titles don't matter. Get stuck on what you want to do and having the maximum impact in the stream you want. And then all the titles and finances that you want will, will come, but it'll take time, so be patient. I started Lifetime Wellness Center almost 10 years ago with the vision of having the healthiest community that we can have. I'm Michelle Prince, and I own Lifetime Wellness Center and ProTherapy Supplements, a nutritional supplement company. My practice is a chiropractic practice that is the hub of the wellness center and the practitioners around me are also, uh, we work on equal playing field, naturopathic, acupuncture, massage, um, nutritional consultations. So each person is, a, is an important spoke in the wheel and I sit at the hub only to be the team leader, the team chairperson, um, the team cheerleader if you will and uh, bring us to our next goals. I started like many people do, just uh, one person in an office, no staff at my front desk and uh, grew to a team of nine fantastic women that work together and um, it, it, you know, it's different for women entrepreneurs. We have competing issues, if you will, in our lives, our relationships, our families, our business. And one of the things that I really advocate for women entrepreneurs is to find that healthy balance of those three things. And so nine of us work together, nine female uh, practitioners in our office work together and, and assist each other in finding that balance. I think my greatest success in business is having Lifetime Wellness Center and being one of the leaders actually in Canada in the wellness industry. Uh, when we assembled the team, it was before people knew what was possible in the wellness world. So we were sort of um, ahead of the curve and I'm quite proud of that. So people look to our wellness center uh, to set the example. And so we're known um, in the industry as being leaders and that makes me very proud that we can come together as nine women and do that together. It really makes me proud. It's not always easy being a woman business owner. Uh, I won't joke and say that there are times when it pulls and it upsets you that you can't be all things to all people. I think that's a very womanly trait to want to wear the superwoman cape and it doesn't exist. And when you set yourself up for um, false pretenses like that, to want it all and have it all and be the super mom uh, and the, or the super business owner all at the same time, uh, it's not realistic and it shouldn't be. It, it should be a balance of what makes you happy. And I hope to, it, to give that balance to other people and inspire them that they shouldn't want unrealistic goals. When you set a realistic goal, you're much more capable of achieving that goal and you will. Being a business owner is not easy. Being a mom is not easy. Being, um, you know, a role model for other people isn't isn't easy all the time. But when you know that those challenges make you stronger, you'll always be more successful in the end. I wasn't coming here to try to do my best. I was coming here to gather people around a common vision that was, we are going to win a national championship. It's not so much about X's and O's. In the end, um, you need to be knowledgeable about your sport, yes, but it is not what makes you win championship. It really is about uh, the relationship you develop with your athletes, changing the mentality and philosophy of the program, recruiting the athletes or retaining those that we thought could go through that change. And, and from there, um, establishing a culture of great expectation and a culture of excellence. We are good. We are the better team. And I really believe from the bottom of my heart that you are the toughest team. Wins on a Time was, uh, was not doing the best. It was actually um, intriguing to me uh, because I had done all my master's degree on how to turn around a program, what makes coaches successful. When I came in, for example, there was no much weightlifting with the players, no dry line training, no running, no conditioning, no standards. So we established all these standards. Hi, Bob. During her interview process, I think she, uh, she showed uh, you know, everything that she was capable of. Uh, the passion, the energy, and things of that nature that uh, uh, I guess all proved to be true. As a head coach, you're, uh, 
You're everything from soup to nuts. You're the, the counselor, you're the academic advisor, you're the recruiter, you're a fundraiser. Uh, I've heard Chantel describe herself as, as the mother of the team. The marketing side of it, the business side of it, uh, the selling side of the program, the recruiting, the retaining, all those qualities that I didn't know that a coach required until I researched it and I had to put it in place to become successful. I was just a young girl, 17, uh, playing some basketball in Alberta, and uh, someone came, approached my parents in the crowd. Uh, she had a dream, she had a vision, she wanted to change things at the University of Windsor for women's basketball, and I think uh, I just really appreciated someone wanting to do something different, and uh, you know, the underdog dream story. Who doesn't want to be a part of something like that? We now have a profile across Canada, whereas before we didn't even have it within Ontario, or basically the city of Windsor. The, the prestige and the profile of the university just having the national championship to begin with, but the fact that we won it while we were hosting the national championship was phenomenal, not only for the university, but for the city of Windsor itself. The dream season is complete. Home sweet home. Windsor Lancers. The fact that we were on TSN live uh, television broadcast coach to coast in a magnificent game and the setting here, the venue and the fan base that showed up for that championship, it just reflected really well on the on the city and what we're capable of as a whole. I have to say, it was a little bit of mixed feelings. I wish I could say it was extraordinary, but it also meant for me the end of that vision, the end of this is all we worked for for six years. How do I feel about that? It was really on the floor. Uh, I had a hard time smiling. Um, I had a hard time feeling happy because I was almost sad. Like, did it mean that now I'm not, Am I going to continue to coach? Am I, what's next? It's a tough profession, it really is, because it's a seven day a week, uh, almost a, a 20 hour a day type responsibility. And Chantel has, has uh, been 110% in this thing since she's gotten here and deserves all the credit that she's received. Chantel's ability to, to reach out to the community and reach out to the university and females as a whole and just bringing the profile and the recruits to the city of Windsor and to the University of Windsor made a significant impact. I take my players into high school assemblies, clinics. 100% of the time somebody asks me, can you come speak? Can you come to a clinic? Can you bring your players? I always, 100% of the time, say yes, unless we have a game. We have to give back. I take this opportunity because I think it, it's important that, that we are visible and that we act as role, role models in this way. The community support and the way the community came around is probably the reasons, the reason why after winning I felt a little sad because I've always was very busy. I'm going to come here, get this done, and, and move out, and then I, I, I can't. I, this is a very special community, and they have embraced uh, me. It's allowed me to be successful. They've embraced my team. They've embraced the program, and I feel like this is a really good place to be. And that's such a, that's so important when when you're a young professional that uh, you see the community is behind you. And I certainly feel that. So I have to say that they did a pretty good job, uh, you know, grabbing my heart there. So that's <laughs> good. It is great to be here today to see you, Richard, great seeing you, and hang always. out with you for a few minutes and yep. just talk about your career and sure. what's important Fire to you. Away. Well, you know what's interesting is we're sitting here in the real sports bar, the ACC, and you're one of the people that created it. And good for you. This is a whole new venture. Best, best damn sports bar in the universe. Perfect. Great. And it looks fabulous. Yeah, it is. It it's really been, it's looks fabulous. It's been a fabulous. huge success. And it opened, what, in October, right? Uh, June. June. Yep. Oh, oh, Just good. in time for the G20. Oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Close it did down. those guys? Did those guys come in or no? <laughs> no, we had to close it down <laughs> close in our first week. Not an ideal store opening. There you go. The uh, first, I want to compliment you on something, and then kind of tell me if you're still doing it and, and how you came up with it. Years ago, when we were partners together in in, in work and in, in, uh, uh, involved with McDonald's, okay, uh, you invited me one time to come and talk to your senior management, and that was the first time that I was ever asked to go you know, to do that. So I was kind of taken aback um, and I did it and it was fantastic in fact I think I may have told you before I remember sitting in that room over the, the arena watching a practice or something and as, as I began to speak and give you some some thoughts on uh, uh, your organization because you had asked me to which I thought was yep. wonderful 
but I'm looking down at the end of the uh, the big table, and Ken Dryden's sitting there, <laughs> and all I'm thinking of, oh man, keep calm, you know, because you know I was thinking of him on his on his goalie stick, yeah. you know, in front of the net, and uh, but it, it it taught me something. And after you did that with me, I started doing it in my organization. So what made you start doing that? And you well, still I think do it? it's like so many things, a little bit of happenstance. Um, I brought in a few speakers from the outside when I was running Pillsbury. But, you know, one day Sears was a big sponsor way back 11 years ago. And I brought the C CEO in. And it went very well. And so I started doing it on a regular basis. And, you know, after you, it was uh, Louis Mel That's right. came in That's and right. spoke. Uh, your replacement, yep. your successor at McDonald's, and and we try to have we have a, a senior lead, a executive leadership team meeting every two weeks, and I okay. like to have an outside speaker once a month. Okay. So if we have say twenty of those a year, I'd like to have anywhere from six to ten outside speakers. Okay. Most recently, I mean, right now we host the Junos this weekend, and my last oh, speaker yeah. three weeks ago was the young woman who heads up the Junos, and she oh. was telling us everything we're doing. And what, what I wanted to hear about is, one, we're thrilled to have them. We're going to broadcast live from Air Canada Centre Sunday night. Yep. Yep. Um, but also, because we're very big in the music business, I want to reach out and do more work with the Junos. Okay. I, want to be in, I want to be involved in all of the events leading up to the Junos. So Great. as we did with you and what we did with Junos and all the others, we want the people to tell us about your business so that when we go to you, in your case, we we're doing sponsorships, yep. we can make sure our sponsorship is right on the mark and we'll give you a return on investment. Right. The other thing we always do is we want to, I asked you to give me feedback on the company. Right. And I still remember you told me we didn't fill up our popcorn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, the, and two days and later Bob, when you were at a game, the popcorn was all filled it was all filled. And Bob was ready to shoot me right, right after the meeting. So, so no, thank we, you very we, much. Uh, we learn a lot from that. And, and it's recognition that you're an important corporate partner or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, of ours. And, um, and I can tell you, you weren't the first to be nervous. I mean, today it's Brian Burke. Or oh, Brian yeah. Colangelo to sit yeah. there. and. And you know, I've had one president, I swear they spent $15,000 on their presentation. Are you serious? And I had other, um, I think you did it quite, quite casually. That's I think right. you just stood up without any slides. Right. But I've seen expensive $15,000 PowerPoint presentations and the late wow. uh, owner and CEO of uh, Pizza Pizza did it on a flip chart. That so, was it, right? you know, we've seen everything. And you're good at giving us some pointers as to what you want us to talk about. Yes. Right. You, what I remember, you said, here's the things I want you to talk about, but go visit some of our events before you come, and that's where the popcorn thing came that's up. That's right. You just said, go visit some events and then give us some actual comments on our, on our show. And I started doing that uh, with, with folks, yourself and, and others. I started bringing in, uh, doing the same thing. It's a huge learning experience, and like we were saying earlier, it's different than a board. The boards you see every quarter or whatever it is and you know yeah. who they are, these people you bring in are just commenting about your business and their business and then you say thank you very much yeah. and see you later, right? We always present, I'm sure when you were there we presented you with a hockey stick or a pitcher. I frame. have a beautiful framed hockey sweater. That talked about being a partner. That's right. That's it's, right. It's and, I, and I would have sent you a handwritten note afterwards. You did? Well, yeah. talk about handwritten notes. I want to share something else, too, that you did to me. And I don't know if you remember this. We, had a, we were having a difficult time at McDonald's one year, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, we were struggling, not just Canada, but worldwide. And it was kind of depressing. Mm -hmm. And I, if I remember, it was the first or second week in December, right near the end of the year. I'm in my office, and I'm depressed, <laughs> really depressed. It's easy to be when you're at CEO. Oh, yeah. And uh, my assistant walked in uh, one day. She says, there's something that just came through on the fax machine. We used the fax a lot back then, okay? Yeah, who uses it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, she walked in with this fax from you. Mm -hmm. Now, all it said was, Dear Bill, I know what you're going to I'm paraphrasing, okay? But I know what you're going through right now. I've been there, done that, and a lot of people do go through it. You'll come out of it. And so will your organization. You've got a great organization. I uh, just wanted to send in a note to help cheer you up a little bit, your friend Richard. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. That was fan. You, you know, I sent it to everybody. And I think I also said that, you know, as a partner, yeah. we're there to help you. When, when we sign up Coca-Cola or McDonald's, uh, you know, Pepsi is our enemy then. We take on your enemies and your friends. Yes. And we do everything we can to help you in your business. So. <laughs> it's been so. a pleasure. Okay. okay Good for you on doing this. And, and, you know, your audiences, I've, I've watched your uh, broadcasts. Uh, uh, you are a very successful CEO of one of the top companies in the world. Great. And Appreciate they continue to have a great success. Yeah. Great success. And they're a wonderful turnaround. New menus, new stores, great marketing. 
And uh, there's lots you can uh, impart to all the people who take the time to listen and watch your videos. I well, appreciate then. that. Thank okay. you. Um, there's a word I'm going to try to pronounce okay. that uh, uh, I didn't go to university, okay? <laughs> I think I told you that before. You went to McDonald's so, University. That's yeah, a I went to HU. That's a okay. PhD. <laughs> there you go. But there's a word you use called merit meritocracy. Yes. Okay. I hope I got it right. Yep. Explain that to me. And where, where you? Well, you know, it's it's very interesting. I I've been a real student of leadership, and uh, I give a lot of speeches on leadership. I'm giving one on Friday night, the graduating class of the Odette Business School in Windsor. And oh, great. you know, I worked at General Foods for 12 years. It's now Kraft Foods, and I realized that they managed everything to the lowest common denominator. We spent months and months trying to get the bottom 10 percent better. Well, where are you going to get the bottom 10 percent? You're going to get them to the bottom 25 percent. And we didn't differentiate enough. And, um, and I, I, I really found that lacking. But I, there was not a way I could articulate it. And then along the way, I started realizing that I really want to spend more time on the top promoters, They're promotables. They're the ones that are going to take you to where you want to go in your vision. Right. And then I read Jack Welsh's book in Winning, I think it's chapter three, where he says, you know, is it Darwinian and cruel or is it fair? And what he's talking about is meritocracy. He's talking about differentiation. It's the same thing Ron Wilson does. You know, Don Cherry busts Ron Wilson's chops because he'll sit a veteran in the, in the press box and he's not showing him any respect. No, Ron believes if you play well, you're gonna be on the power pay, you're gonna be on the starting uh, first line, you're gonna get uh, the minutes, but if not, you're going to be sitting in the press box or sent back down to the Marlies. Yeah. And we're the very same way. So what we do is we, I can tell you who our bottom 10% of the 700 are, the middle 70, and the top 20. Right. The, the middle 70, they're glue. They're very important. They're professionals. Some of them aspire to be the top 20. And with work and coaching and experience, they can get there. Yeah, yeah. The top 20... If they're a, a director, they want to be a senior director. If they're a senior director, they want to be a vice president. If they're a vice president, they want to be a senior vice president. And we do everything to, to, to help them get there. And hopefully and, they all want your job. Well, yes, some do. And right. I, absolutely. And I, I wish more did, actually. The, um, so how we differentiate is, obviously, it starts with the written reviews in, no, in April. Right. The salary increases we give, they get more of a salary increase. Right. The bonuses they get, they get more bonus. You can't even get a cross-functional move here unless you're promotable. Okay. You know, unlike the government, often will move people sideways because the person in this department wants to get rid of the person in that department, not us. If you, we try to catch you passing on bad news, you're in trouble as a leader. Right. So promotions, cross-functional moves, all of those things are all based on we're differentiating and we're not shy about it. So when I first came out with it, I really, if you like, came out of the closet and said, we're going to differentiate, and I showed a bell curve and talked about the high promotables and the hopeless. Um, I was a little shy about it, but now not at all. Everyone knows at our place, meritocracy, we're completing an attitude survey right now and we ask the question, are we a meritocracy? In our exit interviews, we ask, are we a meritocracy? On the exit interviews? On exit interviews. Now, interesting, they don't always think so because often they left or were pushed out because they weren't good enough and, and it's tough for people to hear that. Yeah. Do you, uh, and I learned how to do this a long time ago, it did drive me crazy for a long time, when people stole from me employees. And I trained them and got them all ready and groomed them and, and they started, you know, they kept doing that. And finally, I started stealing people and I got over it. Do you steal people? Um, oh, I never talent? worry about stealing people. We, we promote from within mostly yeah, here. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's one of our things because, you know, if people are working really hard and giving us their career, I, they have every chance to get the next yeah. job. Um, so we do occasionally, but it's more in the finance, IT, uh, legal. Those are things you can't really develop. You, you've yeah. got to come in with the experience. Um, we do lose people too. I mean, I can tell you that our turnover is about 10% a year. Oh, that's good. Half of that turnover, this is full time. Our turnover part-time is only 30%. And probably McDonald's was 100. Even that's great. Was it about 100 oh, at McDonald's? Oh, yeah, it'd be 80. Yeah, and yeah. you'd be low at 80. Yep. So we do well part-time. We, so full-time is about 10%. But about 4.5 percentage points, or 45% of that 10, is forced turnover. And I watch our forced turnover. We're not letting people go. I don't think we're raising the bar enough. Okay. So we're not shy okay. about that. Okay. Do you have any special programs or one or two things you do uh, yearly or quarterly to recognize top well, employees? Well, uh, we do, um, it's all tied in with vision and values. 
So monthly, we do Player of the Month. If you think of all the sports Whoa. awards, there's Player of the Month award. We, um, we do that. And then our four values are excite every fan, inspire our people, um, be dedicated to our teams and be leaders in the community. And we have four stars. We have a star for each one of those people who oh, did great. something. So Sounds that's great. every month. At the end of the year, um, we, the, all the 12 winners get voted on to be who the MVP of the year is. We senior management team picks out the coach of the year. Wow. And, and the recognition committee picks out the rookie of the year. And so our prizes are huge, like two trips to any place in North America, spending money a week off, all Good that kind of guys. stuff. So our, that's, that's very big. So they, uh, they go after it. They, they yeah, know what they can get. And you know the beauty is the people who are winning, it's, I, 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 in my early companies, I saw who was winning. The, no one was really spending time on it. Yeah. And oh, geez, who are we going to pick this month? And it was often very political, ill thought out, not at all. I look right. at the people who win this, and they're the stars. This has been fantastic. I've just learned so much more again just hanging out with you. And I have a favor, though. Sure. I have my little good luck charm that I carry around with me, okay? And I'd like you to autograph it for me. Okay. And uh, then I'll have that to put in my, uh, <laughs> okay. my collection. Will this uh, do it on this, do you think? Oh, yeah, I think yeah. so. Try it. If not, we'll try something else. They call them Sharpies. And Thank all, you, all the guys carry them around here, except okay. for me. I gotta ask you two or three other topics, but why don't we go over to now, what's Richard going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, the speech, uh, the speech I'm giving on Friday, you know, it, I started out at the University of Windsor 41 years ago, and so I'm going back as kind of my final lecture, if you like, oh. and, um, which I won't, but I'm calling it that. And, um, and I'm saying I'm retiring, I said, but if you could read my script, you'd see that I put quotation marks around retiring. Yeah. Because I'm gonna consult, I'm gonna be on boards, I'm writing a book, um, oh, you're writing a book. I'm writing a book. Good for you. And um, and I want to. I've I've you know met with Bill Davis and David Peterson and McGintney's chief of staff and McGintney's ex chief of staff. And I want to do something in public service. Bill Davis would like me to run for politics. I've told Bill I won't. <laughs> but there, I want to give back. And um, so I don't know what that's all going to be. Yeah. I mean, then there's the things like gardening and golf and getting fit and learning how to play the piano. What's your handicap? Well, as a kid, it was seven. Oh. But it, now it's more like 17. So, uh, and it'll never be seven again. I won't do, I'm not going to play once a day. But um, yeah, I want to stay active. I, yeah. I've been here 14 years. That's a long time. It's been great. But it's time for a new CEO, and it's time for me to do some stuff to refresh myself. Well, I, you said it earlier when we were talking also. To be a CEO for 14 years in today's environment is, is fantastic. That, that congratulations. Or bad, one of the other. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing something right. The board kept us. Uh, well, saying, you know, yeah. there was a study in um, in the Harvard Business Review about five or six years ago that said a CEO's first five years are far better than the next five. I'm absolutely convinced my second five were a lot better than my first five, and I think my this last four have even been better. Um, you know, it's I've been able to stay engaged. I've got a wonderful board. Uh, we make money. My board lets me invest it back in on real yeah, sports this. and condos and soccer teams and television networks. Yeah. I've been really fortunate. But if I was a milk carton, I'd be past due. It's time for a new. Uh, <laughs> That's I, a great you know, way to I'd be it. past yeah. due. So. But, but something you just said, because I realized it myself, because I've been told maybe in the last two or three, four years, geez, you're not a bad communicator. In your last two or three years as a CEO, Bill, you weren't, you're a pretty good communicator. Yep. It took me a long time to learn that. That was probably my biggest change I noticed, okay, that improved, that I, where I improved and it helped the company grow. Was there two or three things in those two periods you just talked about that you've noticed that changed? Well, you? Um, you know, way back when I was first a vice president, um, I remember going to my boss at the time saying I want to take speeching, speaking lessons, right. formal speeches. And uh, he said, oh, you don't have to, you're good. Well, the problem is he was lousy at it, so he, I didn't figure he uh. could really evaluate me. So I took those, they made a big difference. So I've been giving major speeches since 1983. I have every speech I've ever given. So I, I cherish good the chances you. to give speeches. I write my own speeches. I spend about an hour a minute on them, and I average 18 minutes of speech. I figure that's the maximum level. Plenty. In this business, you just get interviewed all the time. You're constantly in the news, so you have to get good at communicating. And it is one of the, I think as a leader, 
there's, there's three major things. You've got to be a great communicator. You've got to be great at recognizing people, and you've got to be a great coach or developer of people. Right. And so great communication skills, whether it's making a pitch to your board or a corporate sponsor or standing up in front of your employees, you have to be good at it. And I think over the years, through a lot of experience and hard work, I'm pretty good. Did you have a, a mentor? Someone that you kind of hung out with for a number of no, years? No, you know, I'm asked that question. I think it's, I'm mean, like a tapestry. I picked up a bit here and there. Okay. But I also picked up things not to do. I mean, you know, you can observe. You can observe and say, "Boy, I'm not going to do that." Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, no, I can't say that there's a mentor okay. that I really embrace. I had some really effective leaders. Okay. You know, my first brand manager when I was assistant Scott, my first product group manager General Foods. Um, you know, I've worked really well with Larry Tannenbaum. Yeah. He's we work so beautifully together. Yeah. So I've been blessed with that. Um, Good. But I can't say I've had that one one person. And this is off the cuff. You must have a collection of stuff from uh, the, the sports teams and that. You probably got a huge library of things over well, the years. Well, I don't think I'm gonna have any trouble writing a book. Let's put it that <laughs> way. And the anecdotes will be quite good. How long have you been writing, putting it together? Well, years? I haven't. I've, I've been thinking about it conceptually for a couple of years. And you know, who was it? Um, the woman who owned Martha, whoever owned the, the Washington Post. If you've read her autobiography or Martha, oh. Martha, I can't even remember her name. Okay. She started keeping, her family started keeping notes for her when she was like five years old. So really? she had a wealth of stuff. I didn't do that. I wish I had. I haven't kept a journal every okay. day. Okay. But you know what? I've, I'm not going to have trouble. Yeah. It'll, it'll come back. Yeah. The stories will come back. Yep. When you were talking about interviews, and you've been interviewed uh, more probably than anybody in Canada. Are there <laughs> any, any special ones that you remember that... Good, bad, or indifferent to jump out? Um, I can remember the tough ones yeah. when you know I was firing a coach or a general manager. And um, you know, I'm the ultimate, uh, I'm a CEO. They can't go any higher than that. And, That's right. and sports writers and sometimes sports fans don't think CEOs should have any decision making. They think it should all be general managers. Well, if you take that type of thinking, I shouldn't be able to talk to a lawyer because I'm not yeah. a lawyer. I shouldn't yeah. talk to my CFO because I don't have a CA. That's you right. know, I have experts in every, every field, but it doesn't stop me from asking them the questions, right. making sure they do their analysis and due diligence, just testing them. And then ultimately, um, and when it comes to finance and marketing and stuff, I'm, I think I'm as good as anyone here. But when it comes to being general manager of the hockey team, I am not going to pick who, who Brian's going to draft in the first round this year. Yeah. I'm not going to tell Brian Colangelo who he should draft or who he should trade for. I leave it to the experts. And a lot of people don't realize this also, this is my guess. You go to a lot of the events. Yeah, a lot. And you travel a lot, not just Well, not as to much town. travel, but, no? uh, you know, we have events about five, six nights a week. Yeah. And that's tiring after a while. That's right. So this year is probably one of the first years I've cut back. Okay. I don't go to every game, but, boy, I used okay. to go to probably 90% of the Raptor games and 80% of the Leaf games. And now we got TFC and... Yeah, you a got, lot of you, stuff. You got a full, uh, full agenda. Yeah. You know what? I want to thank you a lot. Okay. This has been fantastic. Good luck on your retirement. Thank you. Okay.